Hi everyone, this is your psychoanalysis mini lecture. So I'm going from chapter 7 in Text and Context, so let's take a look at that. How do you like my comic view? Okay, so let's go over the basics of psychoanalysis. So for psychoanalysis, if we do author, text, reader, we're not killing them off for this particular one. What we are doing for the purposes of our class is to paying attention to the text only and the characters within. Because if you're going to go look at the reader and the author, I would expect you to do gigantic amounts of research on things like the author. Or if you're looking at the reader, say the 21st century reader during a pandemic, you might have to go out and do research about reading right now. So let's not do that. Let's just stay with the text itself. So here's the basics of psychoanalysis. It moves beyond language in addressing patterns of imagery and symbols. So imagery and symbols are the things that we've been using all along. Those are the literary elements. So we're going to use those, but we're going to step a little bit beyond them. It focuses on repression and the unconscious. The literary analysis is looking for what's been repressed or transformed. Keep that in mind. So when we're thinking about psychoanalysis, we're thinking about it in terms of artistic creativity, and we're equating it to the fantasy activity of a child in using psychoanalysis. Fiction provides wish fulfillment in terms of looking at literature. So wish fulfillment, let's think about that. That means that for the character, we're looking at the person whose behavior can be explained psychologically. So we rely on theories of sublimation, and there are two parts to them. Channeling of impulses to socially accepted behaviors. So impulses to socially accepted behaviors. And then the second one is sexual instinct toward non-sexual aims. All right. So Sigmund Freud is our big granddaddy of psychoanalysis. He's no longer used in the psychiatry field because a lot of his theories have been debunked. However, we use him in the humanities all the time. We've co-opted him. So he came up with these ideas about the individual, and we can equate those to a character. So he says, what's the lust, rage, and repression that battles within a character? He also says, look at the id, the ego, and the superego as the formation of the unconscious mind. So the id, the ego, and the superego are all the unconscious mind. We've also got the subconscious mind, which means you kind of know what you're doing. And then we've got the conscious mind where you totally knew that you said that to that person. If you say you, you did something unconsciously, you, that's not try, right, because if you knew you did it, that's either part of the subconscious or the conscious mind. Freud also says that creative writing is equivalent to dreaming and uses it in classic literary studies. Freud created these set of archetypes and myths to analyze literature. So the four things that we look at if we're going to do Freudian psychoanalysis, wishes, fears, pleasure, and desire. So we have to think about those four things. Not all at once, but you kind of look for them as hints in the text itself. So for Freud, a desire is too powerful in the unconscious mind, and it erupts to the surface for the author or the dreamer. And I want you to think in this sense about Buddha Marlowe as being an author. He's telling a tale. And in one sense, maybe we could argue the master narrator is also an author because he is conveying that tale to us. So for Freud, there were a couple of developmental com concepts that are important. There are a whole bunch of them, but two that we really can focus on. Number one is the Oedipal Complex, and it's applicable to boys only, according to Freud. He says it's the central desire for the mother that's not suppressed. And it's the power of the father threatening the boy. So we have two things. The third thing there is the boy withdraws for fear of castration. Right, so that's all based on the play Oedipus Rex. So then the second thing, the concept of development, is penis envy for girls only. So Freud talks about the power of the penis, the actual organ itself. So he's got the boy's concept and the girl's concept. 
Mind you, Freud is thinking about this in the early 20th century, so sexuality is not something that's really analyzed deeply at this particular point. If we want to talk about um, deviant sexual desire and sexual desire for uh, the same sex, we're going to do that in queer theory, but just hang on for psychoanalysis for now. Beyond Freud, the thing that I want to tell you about, when we talk about penis envy, we're talking about the developmental concept for young girls. So the other phrase that we also use with Freud, or, or with psychoanalysis in general, is phallic symbol. So phallic symbol is an object that takes on a symbol of power in a patriarchal culture. And it's, a, it's symbolic in meaning that it looks a little bit like a penis. It's erect and it's long and tall. So that also means that we're looking for where the power erupts from there. And if we look just on our campus, we might think about the phallic symbol as Tower Hall. It's in the middle of campus. It sticks straight up as a tower. It used to be the seat of power in that that's where the president's office used to be and that's the most powerful office on all of our campus. It's also surrounded by grass, and since we don't have a whole lot of grass on our campus anymore, nature is at a premium on our campus. So therefore, it adds to the phallic symbol as a seat of power on our campus. So what can you think of that might be a phallic symbol in Heart of Darkness? Hmm, this one shouldn't be too hard. So there's another concept that Freud gave us Video two for psychoanalysis. I got a little cut off there. I'm working from home, working with what I got. So I was just saying that we have one more concept that Freud gave us. It's called the uncanny. And this is from the German called the unheimlich. Not like the Heimlich maneuver and I'm choking, but the unheimlich. So the unheimlich is a representation of what's unhomely. Something that is familiar, but also fearful. So you wouldn't necessarily understand why it's familiar or understand why it's fearful. But we can see it in characters and you might think about Conrad, or I'm sorry, not Conrad, Buddha Marlowe and the way that he articulates and uses things. For instance, he uses forest and jungle almost interchangeably seemingly in this novel. But at particular moments you look at the other descriptions around it, why does he use forest for one set of ideas and one's one narrative point, and then jungle for the other narrative point, right? Okay, so the uncanny is something to think about when we're talking about Heart of Darkness. So how do we use psychoanalysis? Well, let's just get easy with it. Page 218, 217 to 218, you've got handy dandy concepts which you can take a look at. But what I want you to be careful of is don't interchange suppression and repression. Don't just point out hey, Marlowe has an id ego super ego, and don't just observe that maybe the Russian Harlequin has a conscious and unconscious mind. That's not enough. What you have to look for is where are these impacting the narrative itself. And on 218, you have a checklist. Assume that some wish or fear is being disguised and expressed in the work. Look for the clues that suggest what is underlying the work's surface. So the details that don't quite fit or they seem unusual. If you're just going to say that Marlowe has an unconscious desire, that's not enough. What is it? How does it manifest itself? And then the final one, connect the clues to some common developmental pattern or, the care, or to some trauma or event. So think about Marlowe and his treatment of women, maybe. You could have an Oedipal complex there. All right, so that concludes. We'll talk a little bit more, uh, and I hope you enjoyed this comic version of it.